Love. Hello, and welcome to this webinar where we will be discussing uh, the African Commons and a conversation towards engaged scholarship and a new direction uh, for academics in Africa and allies elsewhere, not just to defend the African Commons, uh, but to restore and reclaim and expand the African Commons. And today we have a very exciting panel uh, who will be discussing this from various angles um, with a proposition that we want to suggest, which is about reclaiming and reconnecting the African intellectual commons to the natural commons. My name is Ruth Hall. I'm from uh, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies, PLAS, at the University of the Western Cape. I'll be moderating this session. Welcome to everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone across Africa and Europe. Good morning to everyone in the, in the Americas and good evening to everyone in Asia. Um, well, to start with, I want to emphasize that this is a webinar that we're very pleased to have on the IASC conference platform. Uh, it is a webinar co-hosted with the Network of Excellence on Land Governance in Africa, NELGA, uh, which is a network bringing together African universities working on issues around land and related issues of natural resource governance and the politics and economics of their governance. Uh, this ne network is actually a partnership established through the African Union with the African Development Bank and UN Economic Commission for Africa, and it has hubs in various parts of Africa, excitingly uh, bringing together universities in Anglophone and Francophone parts of Africa. So I hope that beyond this webinar, uh, many of those watching <coughs> will connect with uh, parts of the Network of Excellence as we try to uh, transcend the Anglophone and Francophone divides and to build university hubs that can support thinking, planning and struggles within society and influence policy around land and, the govern and co uh, governing the commons. So to start with today, um, I would like to uh, introduce um, um, our speakers. We have three speakers today, Professor Issa Shivji, Professor Moniba Isaacs and Professor Kojo Amanor. We had advertised also Professor Joji Chikata, who is unfortunately not able to join us today. So to kick off with, I would like to, with great honor, introduce uh, Professor Issa Shivji, who's Professor Emeritus of Public Law at the University of Dar es Salaam, where he long held various positions. He held the Mualimu uh, Julius Nerera Research Chair in Pan-African Studies at the same university and was previously Professor in Constitutional Law. He has many degrees and honorary degrees and perhaps is uh, best known also for his important work in the Shivji Land Commission in the 1990s. Excitingly, he's also recently uh, published, uh, together with a couple of other people, an exciting uh, three-volume uh, biography of Julius uh, Nyerere entitled Development as Rebellion. So I'd like to hand over to Issa now to speak to us and with some opening comments, your views, Issa, about thinking about the commons and scholarship on the commons, both historically and in the current moment. Over to you. Thank you, Ruth. <clears throat> it's very nice to be again on this, on this platform and to exchange with, views with you and our participants. Uh, given the limited time, I will sort of uh, give a few points in a, in a kind of telegraphic form. First, I want to make a distinction between what I call the old commons and the new commons. The old commons, we, are, we have been talking about them. That is the land and natural resources, um, water, you know, forests, and so on. These are old commons. And we know that for a long time in Africa, they have been under attack by capitalism and being uh, expropriated from the users of those commons. The new commons actually are the ones which start with, uh, so to speak, neoliberalism. Because immediately after independence in Africa, many nationalist governments, given the deplorable conditions of their people with that inherited for colonialism, many nationalist governments created uh, education, water, sanitation, health as public goods, right? 
and these were actually subsidized, they were not fully commoditized. And this became a very important component of the social wage for the working people. So although the monetary wages were, were low, but this was an important component of social wage. Now, as you all know, with neoliberalism, these commons, the public goods, were also commodified and privatized. So education, health, water, and other resources became private. So what we are now witnessing is a double onslaught on the commons, both on the old commons as well as the new commons in the form of commoditization and privatization. And this feeds into the dominant form of accumulation, which I call primitive accumulation, because that is actually the right world. So primitive accumulation in our case was not simply the original state, it is a continuing state. Okay. because these things are expropriated without any value being given back. That's the first point I would like to make. The second point I would like to make is that when we talk about particular tenure systems in Africa, there's always a dichotomy of what is known as customary tenures and statutory tenures. And the way it is presented in the dominant hegemonic discourse is the customary tenures are owned by the community. So these are the commons owned by the community. And statutory tenure is usually owned by the state, but given out to private people. And the way development is seen is the conversion from customary to statutory tenure. And to me, that is a transition to privatization. Of, 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 of customary lands used by the, the indigenous, indigenous people under the custom. Now, the point I would like to make is the concept of ownership, that is common ownership. And you remember some years ago, we had this, in my view, a kind of almost a foolish idea about the tragedy of commons. On the ground that uh, if it is owned by everyone, it is not, not owned by anyone. And therefore, there is a depletion and, and, and devastation of the commons, which is not true. First, I would like to say that the, the, the concept of ownership does not exist in communities, in customary communities. They don't have a concept of ownership as such, the way we understand it in the, in the, in the, in the Western, in the Western uh, 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 framework. What we have is that people use these commons for the livelihoods, in common, but they also maintain it, replenish it, and sustain it through their own rules, to their own traditions. And these are the commons that we are talking about, which are the customary tenure. Now, when these become, they are connected to statutory, through, for example, titling, registration, and so on, then, of course, you get the, uh, 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 the, the Western concept of ownership, and that leads to privatization because you cannot privatize without asserting individual ownership first. You will know that sometime in the, in, in the 90s, the, 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 the thesis of Hernando de Soto became very popular. Many African governments from Egypt to Tanzania bought his thesis, which was what? Which was that you have dead capital buried under the so-called communal and customary ownership. What you have to do is to unlock this capital by privatizing it and by registering it. As a matter of fact, this was not a new idea. All it was presented as a new idea. Okay, this was not a new idea. Seventy years ago, the East African Royal Commission on Land Tenure in these countries actually mentioned this. Okay, so I think there's a second point I would like to make, and many in discussions will elaborate on it. The whole question of uh, ownership. The final, the, the one point that I would like to add, that, that we are talking about conversion, we sometimes forget that the central agency is a state. So state plays an important role in the conversion as well as privatization. State is central to it. Of course, it is the interest of capital, but state is central to it. 
and therefore the discussion of the state, its character, its agency, has to be put under, under, under a radar in the scholarship and discussed. We shy away from discussing the state. We shy away from discussing the character of the state because we are too locked up in our liberal terminologies. Finally, the point I would like to make is the whole question of engaged scholarship. Now, how does engaged scholarship come into all this? I think first and foremost, engaged African scholarship has to join issues with this conceptualization. For too long, we have been laboring under a kind of division of labor, where knowledge and theory are published in the North and in the South, in Africa, we are data collectors. So we collect data and supply to the North, they theorize it, they process it and bring to us back the knowledge. Now that has to change. And one of the important tasks for English scholarship is to change that, is to reclaim our right to produce knowledge from our own conditions and to produce theoretical knowledge, the highest form of knowledge, based on the struggles of our people and our own concrete conditions. Ruth, am I, am I exhausted my time? I think that's fantastic for an opening statement. Thank you so much. Uh, Issa, we could have listened to you for a long time, but we'll come back to you. Uh, so with that, a uh, lot of challenges uh, from you. I would love to hand over now to my colleague, Professor Muniba Isaacs, also from PLAS. Uh, PLAS is in fact this month marking our 25th anniversary, 25 years of, um, of engaged scholarship, what we would like to think of as engaged scholarship. Uh, Muniba, welcome. Uh, just to introduce you, uh, Professor Isaacs is the academic coordinator at PLAS. She holds a PhD from the University of Tromso. Uh, she is co-convening together with me um, our work around NELGA, uh, this network of excellence, and we co-convene uh, a short course on the political economy of land governance in Africa. She's had many significant roles, including a member of the high-level panel of experts for the FAO um, on fisheries and small-scale fisheries. And she's currently leading a, a campaign around blue justice for small-scale fisheries, um, and also as part of a, a civil society and academic campaign around uh, called Too Big to Ignore. Uh, so, Muniba, uh, perhaps I can hand over to you to talk about uh, the ways in which perhaps conservation narratives and narratives around ecological crisis continue to have very concrete effects uh, attacking the commons. And what are the struggles in response? Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, you know, when I was uh, thinking about uh, this particular topic around African commons, um, one thing that really struck a chord to me is how the conservation narrative in Africa is framed as an ecological crisis. And uh, um, I'm reminded um, that uh, that this um, this is very common in in the commons and. Um, and also, you know, um, last year I attended a meeting where uh, John Bellamy Foster was um, uh, uh, presenting and he's an environmental sociologist and Marxist and he explained the destructive nature of industrial development and uh, the new frontier in terms of growth policy and the fact that how this industrial uh, policies and frontier policies are really unkind to nature. And, and the fact that, you know, we all know that no one actually owns nature. The um, uh, issue in terms of conservation for Africa is the issue of fortress con conservation. And, um, and, and if we, we kind of think of what is fo fortress conservation, it's, it's basically creation of protected areas. Um, in terms of terrestrial or marine life and coerce the displacement and exclusion of existing inhabitants. People are viewed as, and evicted by the land, um, customary rights and water, fishing, uh, hunting um, is all curtailed. And what this basically sounds to me is just another form of grabbing um, via conservation. So, um, uh, it, it also, it, it, for me, it struck a chord in terms of that it is another form of a spatial apartheid that we very well know, uh, know in South Africa. 
You also, um, uh, Foster also reminds us that a fortress conservation is, is situated in, in this preservation and exclusion and thereby making biodiversity exclusive places for wealthy people to come and play. Whether you hunt a lion and can go and show or whether you want to kind of sell paradise that I will come back later. Uh, key other authors that I feel also kind of, you know, uh, uh, battle with this conservation is, is a colleague from Busher of the North. Um, and, and yes, Issa, the, the how, how Commons is framed is, um, I'm reminded by that. But it's this, this kind of a resurgence of back, back to barriers and, and in terms of pro-nature the protectionist versus the uh, community-based conservation. And we have many, uh, many uh, examples of community-based conservation like the campfire um, con uh, conservancies. And, and that is not with a problem or neither with a uh, critique. But there's this issue of pro-poor pro people, pro-people pro and pro-nature. And along with that comes the accumula accumulation via conservation, which is basically a mode that takes negative environmental con contradictions of a contemporary ca capitalism and in its departure as a model uh, uh, for um, co conservation um, as the future. And currently on the continent, it is, um, it is this uh, payment for eco um, um, environmental and ecosystem services, blue and green economy, uh, biodiversity, this collaboration between public and non-governmental actors and mainly conservation actors that are, are, are part of this and all in the non-material ways of, 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 of getting capital and uh, um, in, in terms of saving the environment in, 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 in terms of, of nature. So this is where uh, this whole crisis for me also is situated in terms of the blue economy, which is um, uh, framed as an ecological crisis of the ocean space. It's a new frontier, mining, shipping, spatial uh, planning and large scale aquaculture. Elite tourism and marine protected areas all framed in this blue agenda of this economic growth food security and, and also reform policies. So my example one in terms of this blue economy is uh, the uh, protecting the commons in terms of the people. So, so from the people. So a key example is in the Seychelles where we have blue bonds pres preserving marine protected areas. And it's a growing link where conservation and market is used in the economy and, and conflicts over, over people's rights is, 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 is a key part of, of that. Um, then we also find that the conservation narrative in terms of marine resources um, uh, for, for these blue blue bonds, um, the conservation, uh, um, uh, the nature conservation purchase large space of ocean for marine protected areas and actually become part of government in, 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 the, in the Seychelles and the governments are free to give this away. The second part of in terms of how commons is viewed in the blue economy is that we are selling paradise um, concessions for elite and adventure tourism is a key part of, of, of this work in terms of um, and this is particularly in terms of clearing the beach for privatization in terms of hotels elite and adventure tourism, protected areas. Um, and this is very prevalent in the mafia islands. And, and I know Issa know very well about the, the conflicts there in terms of clearing the, the beach, but also in terms of uh, um, Mauritius and Zanzibar where, where these are promoting elite tourism through fortress conservation. Another example in terms of where, where, where the commons is also currently what, what we find is gross human rights violation, um, where, where, for example, in um, Isimangaliso in, in South Africa, Sabelo, a fisherman from Coastal Links would explain 
um, you would basically uh, say that that the conservation and preserving of of, of people and and how their livelihoods are criminalized by a fishing and confiscating of the gears and women are arrest, arrested and uh, harassed by by officials so a key part out of all of this that uh, is the is the role of the state in in terms of the blue economy and uh, how the role of the state plays a key part in in all of this and in terms of 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 the blueprint part of big big part of the blue economy is the sustainable development goals and in the sustainable development goals you get the um, investment goals you get the social goals and you get the sustainability goals and we find that currently the uh, the goals are uh, is used as a pick and choose we only look at the ocean and we only look at the ocean goals and all the other goals are sidestepped and um and that that in an essence is is uh, uh, uh problematic um the last thought that i want to leave uh here with is the fact that um there's a big trend, not only in, in, in the blue econ economy in terms of the role of the state, it's also the role of philanthropy uh, organizations. You get the Pew, you get the Oak, you get the Walton Fund Foundation, all um, funding the conservation uh, narrative and by that moving people away from their uh, rights, their livelihood. And, and on top of that, um, the state play a role in, millet, uh, in, in securitizing and protecting the environment and thereby criminalizing the livelihoods of poor people. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Muniba. I'm hearing resonances with uh, Issa's points around thinking around the state and the nature of the state, particularly the neoliberalized state. Um, I'm going to ask now if uh, Kojo, if you will join us, just to introduce Kojo Am Amanor is Professor uh, of African Studies at the University of Ghana. He holds degrees from the School of Oriental and African Studies and also from the U University College London. For many years, he's been a leading anthropologist uh, focusing on rural livelihoods and small scale farming in West Africa in particular but increasingly has, has been a leading voice in, around land issues in Africa as a whole, um, and uh, has published many, many books. Um, and we're very privileged and happy to, to be having you uh, share your thoughts with us today, um, Kojo, and specifically, what are your thoughts in terms of how we need to question what do we mean by the commons? Uh, Issa distinguished the old versus the new commons. Um, uh, perhaps how would we think about uh, the commons, the old and the new, and the future commons uh, in this conversation. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. What I would like to focus on here is um, the, the extent to which the debate about the commons has been developed within um, neoliberal thought, too, or more specifically within public choice theory and um, new institutional economics. Yeah. So the origins of this new direction, which addresses um, communities and customary relations in a positive fashion, go back to um, Stephen Chung's work on sharecropping in the 70s and 80s. Stephen Chung was a guy who took um, Friedman and to China, opened up China to, to and Nixon, yeah. And he wrote about sharecropping and he argued that sharecropping wasn't an oppressive re relationship, which I won't go into. But this, is, this was the beginning of a new focus within what became the new institutional economics on, um, on the commons and customer relations in land. And this was popularized by Ostrom, yes who herself worked within these two schools of public choice theory and new institutional economics. And um, the main sh things she was arguing, she was advocating for a greater role for communities. She was arguing for community participation in this phase of, of um, 
structural adjustment and liberalization and against state for a weaker role for the state in administering natural resources and land yeah and what she stressed was local management but also within this framework sanctions for the abuse of resource usage to be implemented by the community and the third aspect was self-determination of the community this last aspect we'll, we'll go back to at the end yeah so the self-determination of the community and its official recognition by higher authorities yeah and this was taken up by other scholars like Bruce working in the World Bank here. Yeah. Um, a second trend in which was completely different in the concept of the commons came in in the environmental movements here yeah, from the 80s, particularly inspired by the rubber tapas and Chico Mendes in Brazil in Brazil. Yeah. So this wasn't in terms of the commons versus the state, but now it was the commons versus multinational corporations. But this led to a, an emphasis on indigenous people's movements. Yeah. But when this concept has been translated into Africa, this has been particularly pro problematic, the notion of in indigenous rights and, yeah, and of um, particular people who constitute indigenous people other than the other people, such as pastoralists or um, hunters and gatherers, yeah. And this concept has been particularly problematic in, in pastoralism, yeah, and the literature in pastoralism shows that we have a divide among pastoralists. We have rich pastoralists who are able to define themselves as of pure eth ethnicity and thus command resources from, in the name of in indigeneity. But these also happen to be the richest. And then we have the proletarian types of pastoralists who are not who are often of mixed ethnic origins and and don't have any assets command over resources and these are often slighted and marginalized within the discourse of common resources and indigenous rights yeah but the biggest problem in this framework is the notion of a lack of social differentiation in customary rights and in the commons yeah and the problem is that when we go back to the colonial period, we find that this was one of the main objectives of the ideology of colonial rule, to present African society as essentially based on a communal system of land rights, when in many areas there, there were highly differentiated, social, social differentiated states. There were states, there was social differentiation, there was a difference between urban and rural areas. And there were lots of different types of relations between slavery and feudalism. And in the 80s, one of the things that researchers of a political econo economic persuasion of Marxist orientation were, look at, were looking at was how does African land tenure fit in, in feudalism or well, the transition from slavery to feudalism? And I'll draw to your attention, things like Archie Mafeji's classic work on um, Buganda, which, which is an extremely good exposition of this, looking at tributary relations and, yeah. So in the colonial period, the, the tenure relations were presented as, as communitarian, and this enabled traditional rulers chosen by the state to implement regimes of forced labor, um, and expropriation of land from many elements in the population, from the poorer populations. Yeah. And this was one element which began to be addressed in the independence movements. But at independence, there were two trends. There were those trends which were not that dominant, which addressed land reform. And there were those which brushed it aside. And those which brushed it aside continued in this colonial tradition now adopting, instead of Fabian socialism, it became African socialism, which emphasized the commun communality of Africa. And this enabled the state 
in alliance with traditional rulers to expropriate land from the poor since it was not African for people to own land. Yeah. In contrast with that, in other societies of which perhaps the best example is Guinea, where, the, where there was a process of land reform and a, a radical social movement which, which pushed its leadership towards scientific socialism. They adopted scientific socialism and a theory of class relations within as, as a land question in Africa being determined by, by um, class relations. So this continues into the present and often we find that communal and I think that joins the last presentation. So, so we find that um, um, communal land tenure can, can form a basis for the expropriation of individual rights of poor farmers. Yeah. Classical example which I worked on in Ghana was in the forestry sector. Before the 90s, farmers in Ghana had the rights to, it was recognized that timber which they preserved on their land or which grew on their land was theirs and they had the right to fell it and use it and sell it. In the 1990s, a process of community participation was introduced, um, which represented the chiefs as the custodians of the community and gave them all rights in timber. What the chiefs did was to transact it with timber concessions. So as a result, all the timber on farmland was cut down and exported in the name of, of um, community participation, yeah. So there's a long, two minutes, yeah? Two minutes. So my two right. last points is that there's a long history of expropriation of rural communities, yeah. Which goes back to the um, colonial days, yeah. And as a result of this, common resources are not that common now, yeah. So even in farming systems, where co co common resources were based on um, shifting cultivation, rotational bush, a lot of this has disappeared, yeah. So common, so the, the, the actual task now is the redistribution of land, not protecting com, common land, but ensuring that poor people, women, gain migrants, other categories gain access to land for their livelihoods. Yeah. And I don't think this can be carried out in the, in the context of the self-determination of the community, because in the end, communities, that is a highly abstract concept and, and the community is in the end defined by the state, by the dominant class, dominant class interests, yeah. And these de define what is a community and its community interests. So instead of focusing on community participation in common property resource management, I think we need a framework which goes more towards producers cooperatives and cooperatives in which members of the community of, of the cooperatives are by the constitution of the cooperatives equals in that venture. Thank you. Thank you so much Kojo. Which brings us back to um, Issa's point about the old versus the new commons, but you're talking about the commons still to be created. Um, at this point, um, uh, I want to shift our mode. Thank you very much to our three speakers. I'm sure if everyone could come online, we'd be clapping right now. Um, first of all, Issa, I'd like to start with you and give you a chance firstly to respond to anything that Muniba or uh, Koja has said, but we also have two questions that seem directly uh, uh, for you. Uh, and the one question is, how do you ensure that much needed social science in Tanzania or in Africa at large uh, can flourish when the current authoritarian regime seems to have little interest either in funding or allowing such critical scholarship, which could be a threat to the state? And the second question is, to what extent is it relevant whether the post-colonial African state is run neoliberally democratically or authoritarian developmentally um, 
if there's continued primitive accumulation. In other words, if primitive accumulation is happening anyway, what really is the distinction between neoliberal democratic type of state or authoritarian developmental type of state? Uh, after that, Muniba, I think we'd like to come back to you uh, with a question about the plight of the rural poor and access to the commons, whether this is limited or expropriated. What do we know about this and what measures have been introduced, introduced to the, ameliorate the situation are things getting worse? Is that just a perception? And perhaps you might relate this also to questions, you talked a lot about class, uh, about uh, issues that were foregrounded at our other recent webinar on, um, on the commons, which was uh, highlighting issues around race and uh, uh, gender and the ways in which annexation and enclosure of the commons has a particular racialized and gendered character. Uh, and then uh, we'll move on to you, Kojo. There are more questions coming in. Let's start with Issa. Uh, let's try and keep these short and sharp, about two minutes, on uh, the state and authoritarian regimes and funding and the difference between ne neoliberal, democratic or authoritarian developmental states. Thanks, Issa. Can you unmute, please? Okay. Yes. I think Thanks. first I would like to associate with what Kojo was saying, that we should not romant romanticize uh, communities. Communities are differentiated, and um, there are sort of class interests, and conflict of class interests in this. So I think that is an important point that Kojo is making, and I fully associate myself with that. But I would also like to say, depending on the concrete conditions, that uh, differentiation within communities is subordinated to the dominant forces, particularly where imperialism is very strong and imperialist capital is very strong. So it does not allow a kind of accumulation from, from below. Okay. Accumulation is always from, 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 from the top. Secondly, I would also like to associate myself with uh, this another fashionable term about indigenous people, which is transported from the north to Africa. But who is not indigenous in Africa? Well, how do you talk about indigenous people in Africa? And we had, had some experience about that here. Having said that, coming to the questions that have been asked, it's interesting that the, the person who has asked the question has really more or less answered it himself because he's, he's an anonymous attendee. <laughs> the name is not there. <laughs> so I think that is, that, that, that is an answer to the question he's raising. But, but let, me, let me say that today in the world, we are experiencing a whole trend, almost a global trend, both in the North and the South, of the upsurge and the rise of nation, narrow nationalisms. Some of them verging on neo-fascism. And one of the attacks is precisely on independent intellectual spaces. So universities have come under, 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 under attack. So life for engaged scholarship does become extremely difficult. But this is where the question of scholarship comes in. That is where the commitment comes in. That in all circumstances, people have to find ways of keeping alive the commitment to the working people. True, there are difficult conditions. True, we are in a situation where, as I said, uh, scholarship is, uh, is under attack, but all over the, 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 the globe, uh, people are uh, fighting back. People are fighting back. And the only thing I would like to say that many times, at least in Africa, the, pro the problem section of the intellectual community, the section of scholarship, is that it is too much internalized liberal values and liberal forms of government. And therefore, that doesn't, that doesn't quite strike an echo or a chord among the large number of people who are actually concerned about the livelihoods, about the day-to-day -day life, and about their controlling their resources. So we have to sort of reconceptualize the type of democracy they were talking about. We have to reconceptualize, recharacterize development that you are talking about. Your, your, your second question from the anonymous attendee. 
is a polarized situation, either neoliberally democratically, democratic or authoritarian and developmental. It seems to me that we have experience of both. During the first nationalist period, first 25 years in Africa, we had experienced authoritarian developmental state, which uh, 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 more or less uh, militant democracy and the participation of the people. And now, for the next 25 years, we had the experience of the neoliberal state, whose democracy is actually on the surface, whose democracy has not struck a chord with the people. Because under the so-called neoliberal democracy, we have seen the expropriation of the livelihoods of the people. The livelihoods of the people have not, have not, have not improved. Forget the, the growth rates and so on and so forth. We all know that they don't mean much to the large majority of the people. So it seems to me, instead of polarizing it, the two experts we have had, it seems to me we have to reconstruct and reclaim what would a democratic governance from below mean? And that is a concrete question, and we have to address that. I think that, that the English scholarship must, must address that. So together with the question of uh, social and economic relations, we have to address the question of political politics. Because at the end of the day, all these issues are really politics. Because politics is a concentrated form of economics. So I think that is what we have to, we have to, we have to, we have to zero in. Let me Thanks so much, Issa. I'm going to hand over to Muniba. Muniba, there's an additional question directly for you. How, do, how does the argument for a green economy or green industrialization contribute to the development of industrialization within countries that are not industrialized? How are these countries to respond to this call for a green economy? So a question about green economies, blue economies, and perhaps this is a moment you might want to talk about a reframing around a framing of justice rather than economy in relation to blue and green. Then we're gonna move on to Kojo. Please put in your last questions. Uh, there's also uh, perhaps, uh, Kojo, when we come to you, a question from Mark Vecheruf in the chat that you might want to respond to. Muniba, over to you. Can we keep this short? Um, uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, I'm going to kind of go into trying to answer the question that you asked um, uh, uh, before and, and try to kind of merge these two questions around the rural poor expropriation, gender and, and class and how does that, that happen in terms of the, the blue economy, um, green economy uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and industrialization. I think it is clear it, when... when, when uh, the, the example that Issa just mentioned, it is clear when the neoliberal project and in terms of, of growth and economy, um, that in essence means expropriation of, 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 of rights, of, of land, of access, of tenure, of, of, of poor people. And in, in most cases, uh, the poor people are also gendered, and and it means that that it's women that is that is that is key um, that are, are often victims of of that. When we when we're talking about the blue econ um, when we're talking about the green economy in and industrialization, I think for me it is in in essence that 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 poor people are excluded, their rights are are are, are violated, and and in terms of to get to get them in 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 the process of get a voice in in terms of of benefit and 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 also in terms of um, um, elite capture um, they never really benefit out out of that so so the industrialization uh, uh, in countries where where they are not um, um, industrial it, it doesn't benefit the poor people and most probably take over their land take over their access take over the tenure and and and, and push people aside thank you Ruth. thanks so much um uh Muniba, there may be other questions for you in the chat perhaps sure. or in the q a please do look at those and answer i think there are a few that go to you kojo over to you uh there are questions uh, that are asking about class differentiation within community ma communities. Mark Vercheriff is saying he's seen many abuses of rights within communities, especially traditional leaders, but are co-ops really the solution? Many have failed to deliver, even to survive. Uh, also, co-ops often become places of class differentiation, so they're not immune to these tendencies of accumulation by a few, 
and abuse of resources. Perhaps you can comment on that. Uh, a second point perhaps to pick up uh, that would be interesting to hear your views on, on Kojo is really to reflect on this alternative either to, um, uh, in a sense, uh, the individualization and commodification, but also the imposition of forms of common uh, property as in communal, when in fact people don't hold things communally, uh, but in highly differentiated ways. Uh, this brings to mind also the work of um, Kenneth Okothogendo, Ben Cousins, who've emphasized the complex nested nature of social tenures that aren't reducible either to community simply as a whole, nor to individual rights. What are the possibilities there and what would be the next agenda for engaged scholarship in this area? Over to you. Thanks, Kojo. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree about the comments on, on, on co-ops that um, they, they are, they have been places of class differentiation and accumulation by the few and often in the past have been dominated by states for those purposes too. Um, so wh when I talk about co-ops being a solution. I'm not, I'm not thinking about all types of co-ops, but I'm thinking of a, a new type of cooperative. Um, in which the essence is a, a, a voluntary association of, of rural people coming together to solve their problems but in which there is a constitution in which they all come together as equals. So instead of having some vague notion of a community based, bounded by, by customary practices, these become defined as defined in terms of equality of all the, particip all the participants in which there's no grounds for privilege. Outside of that, I, I don't know what type of form it would take, but it's, it's something I'm thinking about. Based, but those are the two principles, free association, which, which is not often the case with community, often the case when community, community participation means everyone is, has to be involved, I think, yeah where just by your identity. So something which goes beyond identities to a free association. Um, sorry, and the, the second, I've forgotten what the second one was. Um, uh, Kojo, the second one was thinking about forms of tenure and the, co the commons. That okay, is I, I remember. an alternative to imposing this idea that the commons is the community, the communal. Um, uh, it's an emphasis that is widely shared around um, the difficulties of ignoring class, ignoring social differentiation, imposing community um, uh, in an undifferentiated manner. Yes. Um, so I guess that, that is partly a response. That's where the idea of a co-op is coming from, of a new form of cooperative movement, which, which is a conscious community rather than a, a community of identity defined historically. Yeah. And I, th I think this is true that a lot of, and I think a lot of what we mention as common property resources or common pool resources are, do, do have, they're both community resources. Um, and individual resources. They, they, they reflect a relationship of the individual to a community. And what is often not taken into account in, in, in the development literature is the role of extended families. That a lot of the property is not, uh, it's not property coming under a, a chief of a community, but it's property coming under sections of the community organized into clans which, which reflect a, a history of control, exploitation, and collaboration in relation to both resources and the organization of labor. Thanks, uh, Kojo. Um, so 
I would like to, us to circle back then. Uh, and what you raise uh, brings to mind also the, the enormous expansion of philanthropic and development agency financing for forms of community titling or forms of formalization that seek to protect the community in precisely the way you've critiqued. But I think, Issa, we're going to have to give you an opportunity to respond uh, to uh, Kojo's argument, sort of contra contrast between African socialism, which effectively allowed the state to expropriate uh, property, land, and other, uh, and, other, and other resources from the poor. Um, I think that we need to give you an opportunity to respond to that. But as we move towards closing, perhaps we can shift the conversation towards thinking about this agenda for engaged scholarship. We can see here, and many of our institutions, our students, our colleagues are involved with um, describing dimensions of this problem, dimensions of commodification, privatization, their long histories, their new forms, the continuities, the differences. Um, a lot of understanding about that, but what does engaged scholarship in this era now look like? Not just in defense of the commons, uh, but in pushing the boundaries and in perhaps um, reviving the intellectual commons uh, in solidarity with struggles around the commons um, across the continent. What, what are your proposals around that? So the two points is a, um, your response perhaps to Kojo's characterization of African socialism. That's an invitation to you to hit back. Um, and secondly, your vision and uh, argument for an agenda for engaged scholarship in this area. Well, on Kojo's point about African socialism, well, I, I, there's nothing hit back because I was one of the very early critics of African socialism, including Malumiere Zujama because it assumed, as Kojo rightly put it, that our communities were not differentiated, which was not true. Okay. Uh, but I think, once again, I would like to underscore that we have to look at our situation, internal situation, but in the context of the imperial domination in alliance with our compadorial classes and states. So I think that is important. So a concrete analysis of our social classes, a concrete analysis of the character of our state, is extremely important. At different stages, at different stages. I would like to also to quickly respond to Mark's argument about the corporate and the class differentiation. I think his letter coming in, under the chat is, is answering himself because Kojo was talking about new forms of corporate. That doesn't mean that new forms of corporate will not have class struggles and class differentiation. I think looking for a <laughs> looking for a, a terrain without class, without class struggle, is a kind of very intellectual academic way of looking at it. Society moves through class struggles. So in new forms of class struggles we have to recognize, but we have to, as, as, as engaged scholars, as engaged intellectuals, find new forms of organization where the, the classes, the producer classes, can organize themselves. And that's the point that Mark is making. In his, in, his, in, his, in his comment, the organization of the producer classes, okay, which, which facilitates, enables them. Because unlike intellectuals who always have a cynical side to the argument, for the people, they look at what are the possible possibilities of feasibility, feasible in certain conditions. And that is what we have to explore and take a step forward. So of course, these new forms of organization that you, are with, that you are proposing would have its own class struggles, but it will be a stage to move forward for the people themselves to organize and, and, and their own forms of organization. And we very often refuse to learn that people have their own forms of organization and they will organize, they organize the resistance, which you do not articulate it sufficiently. On the final question about the intellectual commons, I don't know, I don't know how we want, one would define it, but my, my, my take on that will be really gumption. We are talking about organic intellectuals, really. Uh, we are talking about intellectuals who have are rooted in the struggles of the people. Okay. So it's not the only scholars we are talking about, or not the activists we are talking about, the intellectuals were the roots in the people and articulate and put forward and push the agenda 
a step ahead in terms of what would be the interest of, of, the, of the working people. Now, again, there's a very, there's a very abstract answer. The abstract answer is because you cannot answer many of these issues in the abstract. Okay, you have to look at the concrete conditions. But I believe, I believe that in each of our concrete situation, there are ways of moving forward the struggles, the struggles of the working people. And I think this, our, 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 our task is, our task is to systematically articulate what people already know, but in a confused manner, in a sense. Okay. And, and, and I think for too long, once again, I would like to repeat, we're too long shied away from analyzing our states, from analyzing the characters of our state. And for too long, we have accepted okay, these states as either developmental or nationalist and so on and so forth, forgetting that there are struggles within, within the state as well. There's of course the other extreme, which is actually a neoliberal one, which I think to such extent was touched by community, polarized with the state. Okay, I think we are far from the time when there won't be state. Okay, the question is what type of state? I think that is important to recognize because the idea of communities without state or communities against the state in a blank fashion is also, in my view, a dangerous, dangerous idea. Thank you very much, Issa. Um, Muniba, if I can come to you, we're going to be wrapping up now, but uh, very briefly, Asanda has uh, a question or comment, uh, talking about the ways in which uh, the old commons were also patriarchal, uh, are the new commons similarly, but are there truly liberatory examples of commons? And what does a radical feminist commons look like? Um, do we see logics of the commons outside of patriarchy? And, uh, and your last thoughts, uh, we've talked a lot about an agenda for engaged scholarship, focusing firstly critical understandings of the state, a big focus on looking at modes of organizing and collective action um, around the commons, understanding and using that understanding to support new forms of, of organization or existing forms of organization. Uh, so perhaps uh, both in response to Asanda's question, um, around a feminist commons, a radical feminist commons, and lastly, your thoughts towards this agenda that we can share. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Asanda, for your question. Um, and is this at this time that I miss Georgie Jakarta to be able to kind of really answer your question in terms of of, of dealing with um, uh, a feminist um, um, uh, um, uh, Comments opposed uh, in, in terms of the new new comments, radical feminist comments. I think for me, you know, uh, one one really have to go back into the history of of Africa and in terms of the matriarchal and and in terms of the colonial project and in terms of how um, the matriarchy in many parts of Africa um, basically managed the commons. Um, I think currently, they, uh, in, in terms of the neoliberal project, there is no space for when you're talking about um, when you're talking about patriarchy and you're talking about uh, feminists. Um, I think it, they, they, I can't find examples on the continent where I can actually tell you that that is 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 really um, uh, working or or have good examples even in literature. It is it is in most cases on land and on um, around the coast where where women are are vulnerable. They are the ones who are excluded um, mainly because of the economic dependency. And even if they do have rights, Rights. It's often the rights that they have. They need access of. They need the the labour of of others to to support them in in terms of of, of their rights. So so I think that 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 um, when we're talking about comments and and looking at comments from from um, uh, um, African lenses, I think it is very important that we, we need to break uh, down the barriers and we need to kind of really look into um, unpacking the notions of patriarchy, unpacking the notions in terms of how we can include these into, into the debates. And I think it's important that we, we're not only looking at the classes and the races, uh, 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 class and race in terms of 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 the of the um, 
of the new commons, we also need to look at the gendered nature and the uh, nature of, 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 of exploitation and also in terms of uh, where, where we can frame these um, uh, uh, new feminist um, uh, commons. Um, coming back yes. to in terms of, yes, coming back in terms of uh, engaged scholarship, I think that it is very important that um, we bring that to the uh, to the issue of 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 engage um, scholarship, and we need to kind of really also. Um, um, I, I think that one thing that I, I I wanted to add earlier on is this issue of science and technology, and and how science and technology is actually framing the neoliberal project, and also uh, as form of, of of exclusion. And I think that 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 is often problematic and and, and in in terms of in terms of the comments thank you Ruth. thank you so much um kojo uh, your last thoughts perhaps you'd like to reflect on uh the comment or question from rene vesper in bonn who asks on gramsci uh wait it's just gone uh it's just disappeared um who is asking about uh where is it gone <coughs> I've, I've lost it, um, who was saying, how do organic intellectuals uh, uh, work together in, contra in contrast and contesting traditional intellectuals uh, as part of neoliberal projects? How do you see this happening? And perhaps finally, uh, any thoughts practically in terms of your thoughts about forging connections across organic intellectuals across the continent and with allies beyond? Um. Well, the, the first point about the traditional intellectuals is, I, I think some of them were excellent too. Like I mentioned, Archie Mafeji. So I, 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 I think in the, in the past, there was probably a much more critical intellectual tradition than there is now. And I think there were a lot of problems with um, from the 80s when um, structural adjustment came about, and it created this. It began to um, it, it it created this whole new sector of civil society and the whole process of accumulation in civil society. So so before when people have come together to form and study groups, social movements on their own violation without any thought of gaining money. Now people can't organize for anything without any thought of we have to get financial support for this or financial support for that. And I remember when I was a young student, senior intellectuals who would take me out for a drink and we discuss lots of things, and that those kind of things don't happen very much nowadays. I don't think. So I think one of the things we, uh, one of the central things to address is how intellectual life has become extremely commodified, and mm. how we've let our research interests to be pushed by this. So I think what we have to do as intellectuals is reclaim, reclaim that space, that open space where we reflect on things, not because of money, monetary interest, but because of what lies in our heads and our hearts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, thank you, Kojo. It's a challenge to us all to decommodify our I'd also like to, I'd like to mention, Fifty yeah. wrote a book on um, NGOs recently. Mm. And I think that is a wonderful book, which addresses a lot of these issues of, of the way civil society has commodified our consciousness. Mm. Mm. Issa, thank you, Kojo. Um, is there any final thoughts before we go um, on this way forward? 
Um, I'm very much realizing that you've been describing a historical trajectory from an era of a great deal of uh, collaborative thinking and working in the intellectual left at universities in strong connection with social formations. Um, and a lot of that uh, was hollowed out through many years within universities. And yet here we are um, on a, a platform where we see in the chat people from all over connecting. There are ways of connecting uh, and building forms of intellectual solidarity, such as we're doing right here, uh, that perhaps didn't exist in the past, which raises questions of how we can use some of the new commons as part of this process. What is your vision uh, or, or your challenge um, to, you know, the next generation of academics who must uh, forge a new path uh, with, um, with academic support for the commons. Your final thoughts. Well, uh, yes, I, I agree. I think particularly concrete in the African situation, uh, even those of us who were and claim to be progressive nationalist intellectuals, there's a time for it. I think we have to move away from that. I'm increasingly becoming very skeptical of nationalist ideology. In Africa, I see that what we have to do, and this has steps have been taken to create a pan-African intellectual community. But people like Sami Ramini and others from Moyo, this was tried in Kodesria, but Kodesria also had its ups and downs. I think we have to reclaim, reclaim Pan-Africanism, Pan-African intellectual. That is the To build solidarity and create an intellectual community which is engaged and committed, as well as collectively reflecting on our concrete situation and collectively resisting the hegemony on us by the North and the Northern intellectual communities. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Issa. And what a note on which to end this webinar at the end of the conference on the African Commons. Uh, we're very yeah. grateful uh, to Professor Shivji, Professor Amanor, and thanks to my colleague, Professor Isaacs, for joining us here today and for people from all across um, universities and elsewhere across the continent and beyond for joining us for this um, for this discussion. It's clearly a, a moment in evolving conversations uh, with a lot of concrete ideas about next steps uh, for uh, for academics in solidarity with struggles around the African Commons. So thank you for joining us, and please do note that this uh, video will be available on YouTube uh, from now on and can be shared with others. Thank you very much, everyone, and stay safe.